Our next speaker is going to be Dr. Charles Levy, who's going to be talking about wheelchairs. Hello, hello. Nice to see you all. It's late in the day. Um, I assume my slides will soon magically appear on screen. Um, uh, so while we're waiting for that, um, what I'm really going to talk about is power assist wheelchairs. And um, I'm going to talk about some studies we've done using them. And the part of the purpose of this is to kind of illustrate what rehab uh, uh, what rehab research can can be like. It's a little different than the molecular work uh, that so many of the people here are doing so brilliantly. Um, if you're tired, I'm sympathetic. Um, and uh, out of consideration, uh, let me tell you what the, let me sum up the talk now. So uh, uh, we studied power assist wheelchairs. Power assist wheelchairs look like regular uh, manual wheelchairs. They have small batteries and small motors. And when you push the wheelchair, the motor discharges a little bit to make wheeling easier. And we <clears throat> um, studied our wheelers, and what we found was that the power assist wheelchairs helped wheelers go farther. Um, that might seem obvious, but actually it wasn't obvious because sometimes uh, stuff that you stuff that looks like common sense doesn't play out. And uh, again, we've learned that a lot through. Uh, medical experimentation where stuff looks good in an animal model uh, and then doesn't really pan out in people. So the power assist wheelchairs for us uh, helped people go farther, aha. And um, that also we looked to see how did that further, how did they go further? And what we found was they went further on, uh, it's not like every day you go farther, it's that what it enables is for you to on uh, some days to go a lot further, and other days you'll maintain. The uh, two more figures below. We could just say next slide until we get. Okay. Um, uh, uh, that uh, that with the power assist wheelchairs, you'll have a chance to go further when occasion calls for it, and that's more in line with what human activity is. Um, the other thing that this talk is going to tell you <coughs> is that there's a balance between. Um, the benefit you get from the activity that the wheelchair enables and um, that this is mysteriously advancing. Uh, uh, sorry, I was distracted by my lecture. Um, uh, that there's a balance between uh, the benefit you get uh, from energy conservation with the uh, power assist wheelchair and how you're going to transport it. And basically, if you have a good method to transport it, you're probably going to enjoy the power assist wheelchair. And if you don't, it's a big pain in the butt, and you might not want it. Um, OK, now for the lecture that says the same thing and a lot slower. <clears throat> Next slide. <laughs> OK. Um, so I thought you might be interested. This is uh, actually a Delta Glide, and you probably never saw this power assist wheelchair. It came out, I don't th I'm not sure if it ever was manufactured. Um, it was the forerunner to the iGlide wheelchair. And I w was interested in the concept of power assist, and so I went looking for, um, don't advance, go backwards. Thank you. Um, I was looking for power assist chairs, and I found uh, Delta Glide, which was a, a, a startup company, and this is their prototype. And if you've seen an iGlide wheelchair, or now it's the next power assist wheelchair, uh, that's what it looked like uh, in its early development. Next slide, please. So this is why I got excited. Will you please activate this film? So this uh, actually is in Japan, and somebody's wheeling uh, it's actually a physical therapist who's trying out um, the eye glide, and you know, again, I don't know how many of you have been walking through your parks and seen people pushing their manual chairs through the grass. Uh, I haven't seen any of them. Uh, and go ahead, uh, activate this one, please. 
So this is an eight degree ramp, and he's basically effortlessly pushing himself up the ramp. And this is a different wheelchair. This is an, uh, the E-Motion uh, M12. It's now been superseded by the M15. And go ahead and activate this. And this is basically the same thing. In the grass uphill, you're not seeing the trunk have a big excursion back and forth. So it seems like, it, so I got excited. Uh, I thought people, uh, I thought the power, uh, next slide please. Uh, I thought the power assist wheelchairs would allow you to kind of have a balance between what's good in a manual chair and what's good in a power chair. And so here's a summary of my take on things. Manual wheelchairs, hard on the shoulders. And people's, basically, when you're wheeling, you're walking on your shoulders. And your shoulders weren't designed to take a full life's weight uh, over years, and it hurts. If you're not a wheeler, uh, you will find it educational to get into a chair and spend an hour getting around in a chair and see how you feel. Uh, I'm, I'd like to think I'm relatively fit. I'm not a good wheeler. I get worn out. Um, the power assist wheels uh, lighten the musculoskeletal load, but they still keep you engaged in activity. And I think that this is important because I believe that doing physical activity is good for you both physically and uh, mentally. Power chair, of course, no uh, musculoskeletal load, which is good, but no physical activity, which might not be so good. Manual chairs are easy to transport. You fold them up and you take them with you. Uh, power assist wheelchairs, the power assist typically adds about 50 pounds, and it's a significant 50 pounds if you're the lone wheeler trying to get the chair out of uh, your vehicle. But uh, you can do it, and uh, I don't see anyone self-load a power chair. You got to buy something to get that to work. Um, so, oops, uh, anyway, uh, manual wheelchairs are really easy to work. Power assist wheelchairs aren't too hard. Uh, power chairs, it kind of depends. Uh, it's, uh, these are user to uh, some people. Uh, I, I work with uh, elders a lot, and uh, if it's an elder's first chance uh, to use a, a joystick, they tear up their houses a lot. Um, I'm not sure if they would do better with a power assist chair. In terms of getting into uh, unusual environments, the manual wheelchair is a little bit limited. Um, you usually think, well, the power chair is going to be the ultimate to get into difficult terrains. But certain terrains, uh, the power chair is going to sink down in. And actually, a power uh, assist wheelchair, not being so heavy, can go over gravel where the power chair might uh, bog down. And uh, probably a little bit better maneuverability with the manual chair. And then the cost, uh, the power assist chairs uh, have historically cost a lot, like uh, six to 8,000 bucks. I think the prices have come down a little bit. Uh, I work for the VA and we get uh, our stuff at about 50%, uh, though actually the, I'm not sure for what we're getting the uh, power assist wheels for. And you can get a, a, a basic power chair for less. Okay, next slide please. So this is an earlier study that we did, and it kind of tells you what common sense would tell you. Um, it's, we, this is a, EM, a surface EMG. You attach electrodes to somebody's body, and you have them do activity, and you record how much, uh, when and how much the muscles burst. And basically, this is with the power assist wheelchair. Oops, it's backwards. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is with the uh, power assist chair. Uh, and this is with a manual chair. And basically, these are different muscles. And you'll see big, hunky bursts over here and not so much bursts over here. So the power assist wheelchair, as you would expect, doesn't take as much physical effort. This is over different um, surfaces. And the power assist wheelchair shows that the different muscles are activated less over uh, all these different surfaces. And these are things like perceived exertion and heart rate. Um, where you're getting a benefit from the power assist chair. Next slide, please. Uh, but again, the question isn't what happens in a laboratory. It's if you have one, does it really deliver the promise? Next slide, please. So there were some studies before the study I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, Ding and Fitzgerald, both um, at the time uh, at uh, Pittsburgh, uh, studied wheelers. and. What they did is they got a group of wheelers and they took some measurements of them wheeling for two weeks with their own manual chair. And then they gave them a power assist wheelchair. They gave them a 
the Quickie Extender uh, chair. <clears throat> I, it may have been a JW2, which is the Japanese version. That Anyway, they gave him a power assist chair. And they said, OK, you can either use your manual chair now or your power assist chair. And that we're going to watch what you do for the next two weeks. And they looked at how much time did people spend in each chair, how far did they travel, and they used a uh, psychosocial impact of assisted devices scale. Next slide, please. And basically, they found that people went faster in the power assist, but they didn't travel farther. They didn't do more in the community. Uh, they didn't have more satisfaction. They didn't have more psychosocial impact. Uh, this was a smaller study, but they also found no difference. So this would bolster the argument that your insurance company should not get you this device because after all, even though it seemed good in the laboratory, people weren't actually getting a lot of benefit out of it. Um, next slide. So um, uh, in there, summing up these studies, there were some limits, and they, the authors acknowledged the limits. They included a small sample size, and um, I think also a small period of time um, that people were uh, being observed. And they suggested that a, um, a longer intervention phase and a more diverse sample might be worth doing. And we agreed. Uh, when you have a small number of people you're studying, um, you need to, if, if a few people don't react positively, it can uh, submerge the effect uh, on the other people. And um, sometimes you need uh, you need bigger amounts of difference to show a statistical difference than if you have a larger sample. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So this is, I'm going to report on two studies uh, with my uh, colleagues. I'm not going to read their names. Um, uh, we used, uh, again, the uh, uh, eMotion system, which is marketed by Frank Mobility in the United States. It was developed by Albers in Germany, and we got funded by uh, NIH to do this work. Next slide. So we thought that people actually would travel further with power assist wheelchairs. Uh, we thought that um, well, there's a question, well, who, should, who, who will benefit? Will all wheelers benefit, or is there a way to select people who are more likely to benefit from the power assist chair? Um, uh, and we thought that we weren't sure, but we thought maybe this will uh, actually affect everyone, but we should take a look at this, uh, if, uh, that everyone could get benefit. I thought that, you know, if you don't have good hand function, well, it could go either way. It could be that you get more benefit from the power assist chair because it does wheeling, it takes some of the effort, or it could be more difficult because it's harder to control the wheel. Uh, so we took a look at hand function, and we thought maybe poorer hand function would be associated uh, with a more clumsy, uh, application of the chair and maybe you wouldn't do as well. Um, we were also interested, I was concerned that when you get a new shiny thing, you can either say, oh great, I've got a new thing, I'm going to use it all the time, uh, but that that effect might taper. Or you might have the opposite effect. Oh, I've got a new thing, I'm used to the old thing. I don't like the new thing. I don't want to use the new thing. Um, you have to actually uh, pick sides when you make a hypothesis. So we made the hypothesis that in the first two weeks of getting these power assist chairs, uh, there would be less uh, use of the chair than in the following six weeks. And we thought that maybe the higher functioning people would have more difficulty adjusting. Next slide, please. So we did an ABA repeated measures design. What this means is we're going to take us uh, wheelers and we're going to compare them to their own performance rather than having one group get the intervention and the other group not getting the intervention. Um, uh, we're going to do daily mileage uh, using bike odometers, and then we also did a qualitative assessment. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. Let's go to the next slide. Um, uh, I, I performed a history and physical on each uh, person that came into the study because I kind of wanted to see who we were working with. Uh, we were looking for people who were cooperative and uh, cognitively intact enough to cooperate with our study, people who are full-time wheelers. We didn't want people who were either getting better or getting worse because then we wouldn't be able to tell from one phase to the next if it was the chair or their condition. Uh, we demanded that people be able to load the chair. So if you couldn't load the chair with the wheel, um, 
then you couldn't be in our study because we knew you weren't going to do well in the power assist phase. Now, you didn't have to load it yourself. If your usual way of loading it was to have your spouse load it, then the spouse had to be able to load it. If you had a carrier, then you had to be able to fit it on your carrier. But you had to be able to transport the chair to be in the study. And basically, we didn't really have an exclusion criteria. If you didn't meet the inclusion criteria, you were excluded. Uh, the chairs had a, a weight limit of 225 pounds. Uh, and uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, we had a four-week four baseline period, then eight weeks of intervention, and then another four weeks to follow people after they got the, uh, after they had gotten the, after they returned to their own chair. So we assessed 26. Uh, we put someone in the laboratory. We accepted them into our study. Uh, then someone told me, then I looked at him and I said, I think he weighs too much. And he said, oh yeah, I weigh too much. And then we had to kick him out of the study. Um, uh, I, I was going to say uh, on the other slide we uh, paid people 400 bucks, uh, 100 bucks uh, every uh, month for the four months of the study. Um, if they dropped out early, then we paid them a pro rate of the funds. Um, like I said, four weeks in their own chair, uh, we lost uh, uh, five people. One just kind of stopped showing up. Uh, one had medical complications, and three wouldn't report their data regularly enough for us to keep them in. Um, uh, four weeks in their own chair, eight weeks with the uh, power assist wheels, and then back to their own chairs. Now, when we designed the study, um, we had to decide which power assist system to use. And for the experimental design, if you have a whole unit that's a power assist wheelchair, then you study them in their own chair, and then you study them in a new chair. But if you've been a wheeler, there's a lot to being in a chair. There's your own cushion, your own shape, and um, if you give them a different chair and they have different reactions, you, you're not completely sure if it's the chair or the method of propulsion. So by using a power assist wheel, we just exchanged the wheel. We took, they stayed in their own chair and just got a new wheel that had this uh, motor uh, uh, that activated when they pushed the chair. Next slide, please. Uh, that's the same thing I said. Next slide. Okay, so we put on special brackets. I'll show you those in a moment. And then we used really commercial, uh, commercially available bike odometers. Uh, you measure how long, the, how big the wheel is, and you calibrate it, and then you can tell how far uh, each time they, there's two magnets, and as the magnet passes, it says, I've done a revolution, and then you calculate what that distance means. Um, we actually used uh, odometers on each uh, wheel. Um, that way, if one of the odometers conked out, we still had data. And we also checked to make sure that the odometers uh, pretty much matched each other, which they did. Uh, we collected logs on a weekly basis, and um, daily and weekly distances uh, were collected by email and phone. Uh, to assess hand function, there's not like a super great scale to assess hand function for wheeling. So we use the United, uh, the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, which is a big instrument, and I picked out some items from that instrument uh, that were specific to hand function. Um, the next slide. So this is actually the M15, the wheel that's come up since uh, we did our study. This shows um, the bracket. So. We had one of our team members actually attach this bracket to the chair. Um, uh, but that's kind of cool, because that's the only a, a modification to your chair to put this kind of wheel on. The bracket has little fins, and the fins fit in the slots. And then the wheel detaches just like a quick release wheel. And that's just kind of showing it with a little bit of distance. Obviously, one of the wheels is off. Um, OK, next slide. Um, we wanted to take a look at. Who did it benefit? So we decided, well, let's look at how people actually wheel. So uh, what we did is we had them uh, propel uh, up and down a hall three times, and then a, a straight 40-meter propulsion. Uh, we had them go on a carpet. We got the thickest carpet we could find, and uh, we used an incline, and, they, and we timed them on these tasks. And uh, of the 20, then we said, OK, it's not really 
uh, how do we divide the group? And we did something called the median split, which we said, okay, who's ever uh, number one through 10 in performance, you're the top group, and who's ever 11 through 20, you're the bottom group, and we'll separate you this way. And when we did that separation, the, uh, it was a good separation. Um, there was a difference in uh, function. Uh, okay, uh, next slide, please. So for the qualitative methods, I'm going to show you a few slides, but I'm not going to read all the words on the slides. Um, this is uh, a, an unusual, usually uh, medical science wants you to do stuff with numbers. They want you to do measures that you can get values from and then do statistics. But there's another way of doing research, uh, and this is qualitative. And basically what you do is you ask people questions, and you write down what they say, and you try to get some information from that. And it's actually a pretty, there's different methods to do it, and it's pretty sophisticated stuff, which means, of course, that I don't really understand it that well. Um, but um, we interviewed people in a, in following a strict protocol. The interviews were taped, then the interviews were listened to by more than one raider, then the raiders got together. They uh, looked through the content of the interviews and they identified themes um, that were volunteered uh, by the um, uh, people in our study. And uh, this says that the, oops, that the first interview um, asked about occupational school and family routines and typical activities of daily living. And then in the subsequent interviews, um, people were asked to say, to reflect on how the power assist wheelchair or their own wheelchair impacted those things. Next slide. And this says the same stuff uh, except in fancier language. If you want uh, this, I'm not sure if this is included in the handout that's uh, in the packet, but if you want it, contact me and I'd be happy to give you this uh, presentation. And, uh, and this stuff has been published, so if you actually want to look at the publications, that's not too hard to get either. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, in terms of the interviews, uh, in the they, when they first showed up, they got the first interview. Then they, we measured their distance for weeks one through four. At week five, they got the power assist wheelchair. After four weeks of using it, they got a second interview. Uh, basically, how's things going with the power assist wheelchair? Uh, after eight weeks, they got another interview. Uh, and then uh, they returned to their own chairs. And after four weeks, we asked them again. Uh, to evaluate the chairs. Uh, next slide. And this is uh, the big slide of <clears throat> all the people we had in the study. Um, there's a couple of things that are worth noting. One is that almost everybody had an ultralight wheelchair. That's a good thing. That means they're getting good service and have the uh, best commercially available chairs to wheel around in. But it also means we couldn't analyze and um, do people, we didn't have a confounder of well, people had lousy wheelchairs, so of course they're going to like the power assist wheelchairs better. Um, mostly, um, they had quality chairs to start with. And a uh, variety of uh, injuries. Uh, one of our people was a student from uh, Zambia, and when I interviewed him, it seemed to me that his description of his disease matched perfectly with transverse myelitis. I gave him the uh, address uh, of the TMA, and he seemed completely uninterested because he was getting along with his life and it really wasn't anything he was thinking about anymore. But I thought that was uh, interesting. Um, and we did have someone with multiple sclerosis. Okay, next slide please. So what we found was if you looked at the whole group of our wheelers that um, during the period that they had the power assist wheelchairs uh, compared to baseline they wheeled uh, uh, 0.76 kilometers, so a little bit, almost eight football fields more per day uh, and uh, on average. And that compared to the follow-up phase, they did about nine football fields more per day on average. Um, and then we also had been looking at these wheelers and talking with them, and, they, and what they were telling us was, you know, we're not actually wheeling that much more per day. Um, uh, it's, it's just that on occasions we can do stuff that we never would have done before. 
Um, so we thought, well, how can we analyze this? So what we did is we looked and said, okay, what's you, for each wheeler, what's you, let's calculate your average. And then let's count up, uh, we have your daily measurements, how many days you traveled two standard deviations above your own average. So two standard deviations is about 95% which means that how many days were you 95% uh, ab above your average? And um, that's kind of like a 0.05 uh, uh, significance level. Uh, so we use that as kind of a proxy. And um, basically, about 5% of the time in their baseline, they were above two standard deviations. But when they got the power assist wheelchair, uh, the group was 15% above their 15% of the days they traveled two standard deviations above their normal. And back into their own manual chairs, it was uh, closer to 8%. So uh, that was uh, s significant and we thought also interesting. Uh, next slide. This shows this graphically. Uh, the high functioning are the, uh, the broken dots. The low functioning is the, um, s uh, the solid line. And you can see that the people who in the lab were able to go faster traveled further on a typical daily distance. But <clears throat> um, when they got the power assist wheelchairs, they traveled further, further. And um, uh, same thing for the low functioning. And af actually, if you look at percentage of change, the percentage of change is greater for the low functioning than the high functioning. <clears throat> Next slide. Um, this is percent days Above. So the other was average distance for the whole period of the study. This is the amount of days above. Uh, and in this case, the low functioning is actually uh, the solid line. And you can see that the low functioning actually even traveled greater number of days above their daily average than the high functioning wheelers. Uh, next slide. Uh, so for hand function, it went to hell. This happens in research sometimes. And actually, if you'd like to have like a four hour presentation on the beginning of research that goes to hell, I could talk to you about that. Um, uh, it turned out that we didn't select people for having lousy hand function. We had 20 people in it and really there wasn't much variation in hand function. The people we recruited generally had pretty good hand function. So there was really nothing to analyze. Um, uh, next slide. So then we looked at the subphases. So is the first two weeks of getting the power assist wheelchair the same as the following weeks? And actually it wasn't. Um, compared to the first uh, two weeks, weeks three and four uh, <coughs> and seven and eight were statistically significantly different and five and six were pretty close. And when you put them all together, uh, it turned out that people didn't wheel as much in the first two weeks as they did in the following eight, uh, six weeks after getting the power assist wheelchair. So this is interesting because if you remember the studies that said that the chairs weren't, had no effect, they only lasted two weeks. And during those two weeks, uh, the people had the choice of using their own chair or the power assist chair. They did not have that choice in our study. Um, so maybe part of the reason they didn't get much of an effect was it was people didn't get a chance to get used to the power assist wheelchair and frankly you know uh, I think in some ways some people are kind of like me and uh, this is what I'm like I don't want to do anything new if the old way works uh, so if I was a wheeler and I had my manual chair around and I was kind of already used to doing things and the new chair was a little jerky I'm not sure I would be inspired to use the new chair or how to or learn the benefits of it again I don't know if that's what happened in their study but there was nothing to guide them there's nothing to guide any of us as to how long we should study this we just kinda I just kinda pick this stuff out of my head or some oh I just kinda pick this stuff out of my head and um, uh, uh, it turned out that for us uh, it looked like we had the right idea that a longer period of time uh, was uh, maybe helped us detect something. Um, I just say this that for any of you out there who are planning a wheelchair study, uh, look at ours <coughs> and think about how much uh, time you should use to uh, study the phenomenon. And it turned out actually that when you looked at this two week difference, um, uh, next slide please. Uh, okay, uh, uh, when you looked at the two week difference, it was the high-functioning wheelers that had a hard time adjusting. 
And the high-functioning wheelers were typically younger, uh, more paraplegics. They were kind of sports active or sports familiar paraplegics. <coughs> and uh, so they really were had a good functioning system compared to um, some of our uh, elder or more debilitated people who once they got in the power assist wheelchair, they're going, woohoo! Um, but uh, it took the uh, more sports active people a little bit longer to uh, uh, adopt, I think, to the power assist chair. Um, so <clears throat> now I'm going to switch and go into the qualitative part of our study. And so, um, so there's 20 people, and we looked to what people told us. We didn't tell them what to tell us. We asked them questions, then we recorded what they said, then we looked through the conversations to, to see what themes were being developed. And one theme was that with Power Assist, they had greater access to diverse environments. And 18 of the 20 mentioned this in their conversations. Uh, in Florida, they talked about sand, gravel, and grass. Uh, There's one individual with uh, childhood onset diabetes who was on dialysis who, was dialysis, who had had a recent uh, below knee amputation. And she said, I went down the ramp and up the ramp all by myself. You know, that is a big deal to me, uh, being able to go out of the house, and the wheels gave me the oomph to get over that. Um, and then one of the uh, higher functioning uh, or more uh, higher functioning people said, there's a route to one of my classes that I take now that I didn't used to take, which is through the grass and dirt. It definitely improved my mood. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> and then they mentioned 18 to 20 also talked about the positive effect on inclines, and a typical quote was, uh, and this was our Zambian, uh, when I'm going up slopes, it is far easier because I actually noticed that I would actually bend quite a bit to try and, you know, but now I just uh, sit like I am pushing myself on a flat place. So it's been really, really helpful. So he's talking about the trunk motion that you have to recruit if you're pushing hard. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so participation in novel activities. 13 out of 20 volunteered that um, they were doing things that they wouldn't have done otherwise. Uh, uh, somebody with an incomplete C6-7 tetraplegia said, I went to the mall once uh, that I guess I wouldn't have went if I didn't have the power assist wheels. And uh, our woman with MS said, when I was in Miami with my two-year-old, I was able to just go out with her and uh, sit her on my lap. It was just very pleasant and something I don't do very often. I can't do often. I don't have to focus so much on putting effort into wheeling so I can just kind of sail along with her and I can focus on her and talk to her. Next slide, please. Uh, 13 out of 20 mentioned that they were more independent and felt less like a burden to others. Uh, there was a 28-year-old woman with a lumbar spina bifida. I would almost rather not ask for something because it's a pain in the butt to always have to rely on somebody else. I guess I feel less ashamed because when you're around people who take that for granted, it's kind of like you're a burden. So she was saying that with the power assist, she could do more, and it made her, f she was willing to do stuff that she might have been able to do, but would have to ask for assistance. Next slide, please. Uh, less fatigue, uh, 16 out of 20. Um, <coughs> uh, our woman with uh, MS said uh, at, uh, about activity at baseline, but of course it is limited, not just because I'm not mobile, but also because my energy is very limited. So I don't do everything that I would like to do. And after the power assist, she said, I'm feeling real positive and upbeat. Energy-wise, it helps. And next slide. Uh, so we looked at pain. Now, it turns out of the 20 people, only six really reported a pain problem. But of the six that had pain problems, all of them said they had a pain benefit. Um, uh, and again, this is a younger wheeler with a spinal cord injury. Uh, I have muscle aches in my back every single day, no matter what I do. I mean, it's a given. I'm going to have to live with that the rest of my life. Uh, my back doesn't hurt nowhere near as bad as it used to before I got the wheels. Uh, next slide. Okay, so, uh, so overall, people had a lot of nice things to say about the power assist wheels, but we didn't, but they also volunteered difficulties. Uh, 13 out of the 20 said the weight of the power assist wheels was negative. Um, uh, one said, the transferring is just more of a psychological drain. It's just an annoyance. And uh, another spinal cord injured individual said, I can see that the most difficult part of this is transferring it into my car just because it takes longer. Uh, next slide. 
<coughs> seven out of 20 said control was a little difficult, but five said control actually had positive things say, to say about the control of the chair. So that's kind of a wash. Next. And so this is kind of summing up what we heard. Uh, this is just putting it in a table. Uh, so terrain uh, actually uh, says 17, but I think it was 18. Um, uh, you can read it yourself. Positive evaluations, and really no one has negative evaluations about the things that are positive about the chair. Um, next slide, please. Um, uh, there's, uh, again, uh, two didn't like the way that, uh, two liked the way the chair looked, three didn't like the way the chair looked. Um, uh, two actually liked the way the chair, one of them liked to push the heavy chair around, felt it was a good conditioning exercise, but I'm not sure if that's what I, why I would recommend it. Um, uh, uh, oops, uh, this must have been an earlier table, sorry, I've got five and six when the other numbers were reported differently. Uh, battery life was a problem. Um, the ch chair at the time, I think, was rated for 10 miles per day, but if you look at the current literature, the current literature says it's only rated for six miles a day with the old battery, and the new battery is uh, somewhere over 10. Um, and I want to say like 14 or 16, but I can't remember for sure. Um, some, a, a couple found the chair a little bit wider. Uh, transport, we've already talked about. Now we asked them, would they get one? Yeah, we must have left off the last wheeler because all the numbers are short a little. Um, uh, 12 said they would, 8 said they wouldn't. Um, now we didn't ask them how they would get it, uh, but would they like to have it? And um, I'm pretty sure that everyone who didn't have a, their own lift, didn't have a way of lifting it, said they really would not get the chair because the transport of the chair was significantly difficult. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I think power assist wheels actually do increase distance. They do increase your ability to go out and be in the world. Um, uh, I think that intervention phases should be longer than two weeks, um, or you should at least take that into account. Um, uh, if you're a, a, a better able wheeler, that's uh, um, more likely to have initial trouble or resistance to the power assist wheels from what we've seen. Um, people like how that works on diverse terrains, inclines, like the new activities. Uh, they had increased social and familial participation and less fatigue, uh, but they didn't like the weight, the transportability, the battery life. A little bit with the, with, uh, I have battery life twice. Uh, uh, oh, no, this is actually the note that the width, the battery life, and control have been improved because it's a new system, at least it looks to be improved, um, and I really don't think, I have no reason to doubt that it's been improved, but I haven't tested it, so I can't give you a scientific, it's been improved. Uh, next slide, please. This has nothing to do with anything I've been talking about, uh, but I like it. Uh, this is a <coughs> um, uh, Remy Jada. He has uh, had polio as a kid, and I got to visit him in Africa, and uh, the good folks at Top End gave me a uh, uh, ultralight wheelchair that I could give to him and if you'll roll the film you get to see him roll around. Yeah, um, so this is <coughs> uh, um, I'm happy to talk to you about rehab issues, but I also uh, uh, am a peculiar and dedicated uh, banjoist and went to Africa to learn the roots of the banjo, and I'd be glad to talk to you about that and take questions about banjo music uh, if you like. No, that's a regular manual chair. Uh, at the end of the film, which I think is coming up soon, he gives us a big smile, which makes me happy. And I see the Ben, so that must mean I'm just about done. <laughs> it's always like that with banjo. Uh, anyway, thanks for your attention. Well, that was great. So uh, you, you have arrived. Stephanie, I'm going to ask if you don't mind letting folks know that we're going to be giving instructions for the small groups if they want to pop their heads in or open the doors. Um, so let me tell you the best news of the day. The best news is at 6 o'clock, the cocktail hour begins on the fourth floor. Uh, the, the bar will be set up. At 7 o'clock is dinner on the fourth floor 
right above us, the San Antonio Ballroom. Uh, we're going to have a great keynote speaker. We're going to have a couple presentations. It's well worth coming to dinner and just relaxing. No slides, no heavy stuff. Let's uh, sit and enjoy uh, a meal together and at six enjoy some cocktails together. Um, the small group session based on time uh, with the time we have left, I'm going to say we're going to commit to one session. So you need to pick out of the lists what is your top priority. I apologize for that, but it's a, a necessary evil. And let me tell you how it's going to work. There are six sessions. Um, Diana Logan, if you'll raise your hand, she's going to be running the pain management session here in the front corner right by the podium. So Diana Logan, pain management here at the front. Uh, Gina Remington, will you raise your hand? So Gina Remington, at the table where she is, she's going to stay put. That session is going to be on participating in clinical trials. So everybody who's interested in ever getting a, a stem cell or taking part in a walking trial and you want to learn more about clinical trials, Gina is the expert. Uh, Chuck Levy uh, will continue either on wheelchairs and orthotics or the banjo, your choice, uh, back in the, the right in front of the AV group. Dr. Adam Kaplan, raise your hand. Adam uh, will be discussing depression in the back of the room right where he is. And then Daniel Becker will be discussing spasticity in the next room. And Janet Dean will be running a pediatric session in the next room. OK, so spasticity and pediatrics next door, depression, wheelchairs, orthotics, pain management, clinical trials here. Thank you guys for your attention. When your sessions are done, go relax, 6 o'clock, fourth floor cocktails. <laughs>